So we're glad you're all here tonight. Welcome to the DN Hall of Fame online version. I am, as my name says, Kirsten Swanson Wilder. I um, worked on the paper from about 87 to 89. I just worked on the copy desk. I actually worked for Chuck Green, who I see is on the call down here, and Joan Rezac. Those were my bosses when I was there. And um, still do journalism today. So everything I learned there has been super helpful. Um, for my career because I, today I'm the editor of the uh, University of Nebraska's alumni magazine. It's called Nebraska Quarterly. And so that's what I currently do. So I get to be on campus today. Well, not today, cause I'm at home all the time, but I tell people I didn't get very far because I start my first paying gig was at the Daily Nebraska and I've only moved like one building over because the Wick Center is a building away. <laughs> um, and that's as far as my career has taken me thus far. What's your new life? My new life? is yeah I'm, I'm the editor of the alumni magazine oh ah, ah. so, so that's that, what i do that's today. a new position or uh well there's always been one but I've, I've had this job for five years previously i worked in los angeles i was an editor at variety magazine covering hollywood for 25 I years see. Oh. Right. So that's what else i did uh so we're going to kick off tonight with alan vaughn the general manager that took over from our beloved dan chatill alan what you got for us Okay, so I'm going to be the first person to test and share my screen. Great, okay. Um, can everybody see, nope. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yep. Great, okay. So it made me realize that there was no DN styled PowerPoint, which we need, we're gonna work on that. Um, this is as fancy as I can make it. So I was talking to, to Bruce uh, before, we, before we officially got started. And uh, one of my big emphasis here uh, at, the, at the DN, especially as we were into the pandemic and we were really trying to as sales were slow and as things were weird, we were like, well, what are the things that we can, that we can really try to do with this time? And one of the things I wanted to do was put a lot more emphasis on, uh, on just having better relationships with alums. Because one, I like that. I'm a former uh, reporter and editor and I got into it because I like people. And so I really do want to get to know all of you or as many of you as I can and learn about you and, and of course, my wife is a Daily Nebraskan alum, and for, you know, she speaks so fondly of it. I was like, I need to really kind of figure out what this is all about. So we started an uh, alumni advisory board, and one of the things that we're doing, some of them are here with us tonight, and one of the things that we did was really trying to figure out how often do alums want to be contacted, and how often, and what do they even want to know? And so I'm going to drop this link in the chat. And this is a survey that our committee created. And I'd love for you to fill it out because it gives us a little bit of information. It'll give, you, give us your email address, but it will also just ask questions about, are you still in the business? And uh, you know, how do you, would you prefer for us to communicate? So one of the things that we, that, uh, or some of the things that we have some of you maybe are members of our Facebook group, and if you are, thank you very much. There's a little bit of business, a little bit of fun, a little bit of everything that's going on in there. I find it a pretty good way to, uh, and I try to share some news as pertinent to. Uh, we do a quarterly alumni newsletter right now where we share some of uh, the interesting content that Grace and David's teams are making, and uh, just a little bit of taste of that, and then also any kind of pertinent alumni news. Um, we also have a LinkedIn. So if you're into LinkedIn, we do have a Daily Nebraskan account that we're trying to maybe uh, use that to communicate a little bit more. Lainey, thank you very much. Lainey is like my right hand uh, partner there with, uh, with, the, with the alumni advisory group. Uh, and then also, like I said, did you fill out the survey? So so we're just really trying to figure out how often, what even, or if there's another medium that maybe we should be looking into. Um, we do have an Instagram 
uh, that shares that, that Jane uh, has got started and, and we run with some, some fun older photos and, and really trying to reimagine what some of that looks like. So first of all, just from, from what is it that you wanna know? How can we reach you? That's one of the things that I'm trying to, to figure out. I also mentioned that we have an alumni advisory board and right now it's made up of 11 alums and I'm just so happy. I mentioned this in the last meeting we had. I'm so happy about it. We've got three different subcommittees, one focusing on engagement, one focusing on training, and one focusing on fundraising. And the training have uh, Mike Riley, who's here on the call, uh, chairs that one. And they have really got in and done, what, Mike, a couple of trainings already. Like, it's been great. They even have a skeleton for what the next year is going to look like. So I'm really happy because I know there are so many uh, alums that either have great experience or continue to still be in the business. And I just really want our students to be on the, as close to the cutting edge as what's actually happening in the real world as possible. And especially to supplement things that they're learning in the J school. Because as you guys know, they're maybe not learning everything that they should be learning in the J school. So I'm excited to be able to supplement some of that as well. Um, and if you're interested in joining our alumni advisory board, that is my email address, and I will also uh, put that in the uh, in the chat as well. Um, the next thing that I was going to mention is the Hall of Fame right now lives in our hearts and our minds and on Zoom, right? Like it, it's, and I'm so thrilled that everyone's here and. I want to go ahead and announce that this is not, I'm not a photojournalist, but this is a picture of where the physical Daily Nebraska Hall of Fame is going to live. Now, I need you, you know, see my map, my cursor here. There is a screen going to be a screen right here that's going to be vertical just like these. I, by the way, I just wanted you to know that this is like a jackpot of all three of these things saying the same thing. They don't normally all say the same thing. Um, we're going to have a, one of these tall vertical screens right over here that is going to be dedicated to all things Daily Nebraskan alumni, especially the Hall of Fame. We've got a member of our staff that is creating essentially a PowerPoint that's going to run on there, but we also have some other ideas for some content uh, that can flash on this. If you're familiar with the uh, Nebraska Student Union or the City Campus Union um, or just the campus in general. This is essentially walking from what you would call the heart of campus by the fountain and in through the north side of the union. So this is a pretty high profile spot. Like if you go up these stairs and around, you are in like Valentino's and you're in the food court. So we get a lot of traffic. We sell ads on those three screens right now, but I'm excited that uh, essentially members of the Hall of Fame are going to be immortalized on that screen. We're also looking at, they're saying that we can paint and, and essentially decorate the entire walls, even all the way to the ceiling. So we're looking into some of that too, which was very excited that the union even considered this at all um, because they easily could have said no, but they said yes. So congratulations to our new Hall of Famers hopefully up by the summer, definitely by the beginning of school, that should be up. And I'll definitely send out some photo updates of that as well. Um, and the last thing that I will talk about is just really saying that, um, you know, we talked, we did a fundraising campaign uh, a few years ago. This was before I, before I showed up. And just kind of as advertising gets weird and the landscape changes, I just keep having this dream and this vision of where we don't have to really mess with student fees and we don't really have to mess with advertising and we can really have true independence. And so I really just want to uh, say thank you to everyone who has donated to the editorial support fund. That fund right now is at about 280,000. It just uh, peaked up over that, which, uh, provides roughly twelve to $13,000 annually to our budget. And I'm very, very thankful because that takes a lot of the pressure off. And I really think that we've got an opportunity to build that even further. So I'd like to ask all of you 
uh, to consider going to this link right here, which I will also put in the chat, and consider making a recurring monthly gift. Those are the types of things that can really help us. Whenever I feel like I say things about, can you give the Daily Nebraskan some money? You kind of evaluate and you say, how much can I give in this very simple moment? And I really want you all to consider making it more of a monthly type of thing. So I'm going to drop this in the chat. And also we are going, this is really the soft launch. We're going to also uh, create, I guess, for lack of a better term, a, a new fundraising campaign. We're going to work with the foundation this summer and then moving through uh, essentially starting in the summer and going for the next six months or so to see what it is that we can do. So more on more to come on that, but I would love if you all would be some of the first people to be able to do that. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and I'll put this link in the chat. And now I'll turn back over to Kirsten so we can get to the real heart of the show. If you have questions, also put them in the chat. Thanks, Alan. You are doing a great job as a general manager. I love that you are in this position and the things you've done and created sort of make my DN alumni heart happy. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, the 2013-14 editor of the Daily Nebraskan, Haley Conniff, is on to talk about uh, the judging that went on for this Hall of Fame. Now, Haley, where are you coming to us from? I am actually in Omaha right now for the first time since December 2019. <laughs> back seeing my family, um, but I'm in LA right now. Um, I'm reporting for Law 360 there, um, but I did, I wanted to thank you guys so much. Um, everyone who took the time to send us nominations over the past few years. It's been a ton of fun for us on the committee to learn so much about fellow alumni, but also about all these crazy talented staffs of the past who accomplished so much. Um, and so I wanted to give a big thank you to our Hall of Fame judges this year, which was um, Bruce Brugman. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Bruce. I realized we email all the time and I've never said your last name out loud. So here we are. Um, also Jessica Kennedy Matthews, Patty Paxton, Kylie Cruz, and Courtney pitts Matern were on that committee. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, as Alan mentioned, we have that uh, physical Hall of Fame display coming, which um, Dan and Alan have both put a ton of work into. So thank you both so much. That's really exciting and awesome that we got it in that spot. Haley, I forgot um, to mention, uh, sorry oh, yeah. to interrupt, that uh, the way that this really got off the ground was that Dan Chatil, and of course he would have done this, essentially won a grant to help pay for the installation of it. So thank you to Dan for, for getting that off the ground. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's awesome, yeah. Um, and so just wanted to quickly remind everyone we are always accepting nominations. Um, you can send them to hall of fame at dailynebraskan.com. I can also drop that into the chat. Um, and Nominees who don't win just automatically roll over and are considered for the next round. So you don't ever have to worry about resubmitting everyone. We're always gonna see that nomination again. Um, so please continue to send those in. Thanks. Cool. Um, you always have a plethora of entries, Haley, yes, to choose from. At this point, we should. Yes, way too many, honestly. That's great because we're all amazing. Just ask us. Uh, okay, we will start with our first award tonight. So exciting. It is the Rising Star Award and that honors an alum that is 35 or under. So that means my 80s grads were out um, who has remarkable accomplishments early in their career. And this award's gonna be presented by the 2015-16 editor of the DN, Chris Hetty, who's coming at us from I think Kansas. Are you down in Kansas, Chris? 
Yes, I am. We're burning fields to send up to um, to Lincoln today, actually. So yeah, we don't love that. So when Kansas burns things, then we smell them here, and like they bring the kids in from the playgrounds where I live in South Lincoln. So maybe you could do something about that. I'll do my best, but uh, but uh, it's kind of out of con out of my control. Okay, but not as bad as the wildfires poor Haley has to deal with out in LA. I'm familiar with that as well. Um, so Chris, I have one question for you before you present our first award. What or who were you most scared of when you worked at the Daily Nebraskan? You're talking to me? I'm talking to Chris. Um, I mean, Dan? Yeah, I can relate to that. Because when I had to work with him for this, I like called Alan first before I called Dan because I'm still afraid of Dan. Yeah. I know. Why is he so scary? He's because uh, he knows more than you. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. Right, when more than me and more than everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, because Dan uh, requested it, I did make a PowerPoint. Um, so it don't, but here's the problem. Um, there's a joke on the first slide and it's gonna be ruined if you have your um, eyes open. So if you wanna like really enjoy the PowerPoint, then close your eyes really quick as I share the screen. Um, just close your eyes, please close your eyes, please close your eyes. Just please close your eyes. Chris Hetty. Please close your eyes, everybody close your eyes. Okay, hi everybody, uh, I'm Chris. Um, I am the 2015-16 uh, Editor-in-Chief and I'm really, really proud to present the Rising Star Award to my dear friend Paige Cornwell. Um, if you don't know Paige, you should know Paige. Um, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter at the Seattle Times. She, um, as the first slide shows, more than 200 bylines at the DN from 2009 to 2013, graduated from UNL, we'll say late 2013. Um, she won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015 um, uh, for breaking news coverage with the Seattle Times covering mudslides. And in 2015, she was named SPJ New Journalist of the Year. Uh, this photo that you're seeing was taken in a New York Times uh, a story that they did on the Seattle Times um, about covering COVID, and Paige was one of the early ones to cover COVID. We're, we'll get there. Um, that's how they want you to look at Paige. This is how I really want you to, to fix your page, um, and it's, a, it's as a team player. Um, I nominated Paige for this award. I'll, I'll get to it a little bit later, but uh, I... I Paige went to the same high school as me. Uh, she's the reason why I joined the high school newspaper, why I went to UNL, why I joined the Daily Nebraskan, why I uh, applied for editor-in-chief, why I applied for any internship I did, um, why I ever won any award I did because she edited it. Um, and she, uh, when she was an intern at the Lincoln Journal Star, they needed a, uh, a photo for their Halloween paper. Um, so she uh, she volunteered, uh, and that's kind of who Paige is. Paige is somebody who, for the greater good of the newspaper, she's going to do what what needs to be done. I'll start really quick, just kind of running through Paige's career, right? So joins the DN as a freshman, as a little baby freshman. Um, from what I understand, she the the positions that she held at the DN they were quite vast. I think she wrote for every section but opinion, but she actually might have written for opinion. She was a news reporter. She was an A and E senior reporter. Um, she was assistant sports editor uh, when she was asked to be, which was great. Um, she she wrote, I was sports editor two years after her, and uh, we had left up a, a bulleted list that she made, um, and it was called the Paige Cornwall Guide to Not Sucking. Um, and so I just crossed her name out and put my, my name on it and just said that it was the Chris Hetty Guide to Not Sucking. Um, but it was, the, it was you know, the, the same thing. Um, Dan sent me some headlines. So obviously this is the, these papers she was on the front page of. Uh, she sent me, Dan sent me some headlines of stories that she wrote, some highlights. Um, she, she did write about one of her, her terrible first roommate, which I'm not going to divulge what her first roommate was, but I would really love you to Google like Paige Cornwell roommate, Daily Nebraskan. It's a fantastic story um, uh, and not particularly appropriate. Uh, uh, she wrote about rock, paper, scissors competitions. She wrote about the bowling team. She was actually uh, the bowling beat reporter. And from what I understand, uh, kicked ass at it. 
Um, I asked some people about Paige's time at the DN, some pe people that Paige and I both know, and, and uh, one pro former professor said that he was most impressed with her bowling coverage. Um, you can also see here, uh, she wrote about really serious issues too, right? She wrote about uh, legal immigration in Fremont. She wrote about human trafficking. Uh, she wasn't afraid to write about condoms. Uh, like Paige is somebody who, if you look at just these experiences, she's a team player, right? She's going to go out and she's going to write stories that people might be uncomfortable with or don't want to pick up, right? Nobody wants to be the bowling reporter, but Paige did want to be the bowling reporter, right? That's what makes her so great. Um, outside of the DN, right, during um, her time in college, Paige interned at the Journal Star, like I said. She interned at Vice. She interned at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. She interned at the Seattle Times. Uh, she also wrote for the New York Times Student Journalism Institute. Uh, she also wrote for USA Today. Um, and she also um, worked on two in-depth projects in the J School, one on immigration and one called Native Daughters. Um, this is one of my favorite Paige Cornwall stories because this is like, of course, this would happen. But she was a, a reporter at the Atlanta Journal Constitution or an intern there. And Obama was coming to Atlanta. And the AJC was like pretty sure that Obama was going to go to this hot dog place, but they weren't really sure. So they just like had Paige posted up um, at this hot dog place. And of course he showed up. From what I understand, uh, they told her not to stand, uh, but even if she did, she would only go up to like his waist anyway. Um, but like security told her to sit down. Um, but like, of course, Paige just like, okay, yeah, I'll go to a hot dog place. I can just stake it out. And it obviously pays off. Um, the thing that Paige did uh, at, during her time at Nebraska was not only contribute so much to the DN, but also contribute so much to basically setting the path of like, okay, that's what I want to do. Uh, there were so many student reporters who saw what Paige's path of Journal Star, Vice, AJC, Seattle Times that said, okay, how do I repeat that? How do I do that? Um, after the DN, um, she again was a part of the breaking news team at Seattle Times that won a Pulitzer Prize in 2015. Uh, raising the bar just a little bit higher for everybody else that's, uh, you know, in the millennial room. Um, uh, th this was a good quote I found that the, the journalism school wrote um, whenever she won the, the Pulitzer Prize, uh, the J School wanting to take credit for the only Nebraska experience she got. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Paige was somebody who, uh, for this project, she talked to a lot of people who had passed, uh, you know, family members, people who had passed away. Um, I think Paige is her deep empathy for people and for reporting allows her to tell uncomfortable stories and to really shed light onto things that are pretty uncomfortable. Um, and uh, she's willing to do it and, and believes that it's important. Um, we've seen that in her international coverage. We've seen that with her, you know, domestic coverage, landslide, or excuse me, mudslides, um, and even with, with COVID coming up too. Um, COVID is obviously been a thing for the world over the last year. Paige is the first reporter that I know of who started covering COVID uh, very seriously. Um, uh, that, and that's just talking about uh, coverage I saw like online or even on Twitter, right? So on February 5th was the first time Paige wrote about COVID in the Seattle Times. Um, obviously COVID kind of began um, in, the, in the US, uh, kind of in the Washington area or in the Seattle area. So um, Again, that New York Times photo you saw at the beginning, this is part of that story um, where they talked to Paige. Um, I loved that they talked about her her extremely messy desk. Uh, her car was always that way too, which I appreciated that it like that at least hasn't changed that that hasn't changed for Paige. Um, but I love this ending of the story, um, Paige talking about you know her being healthy and needing to take advantage of it. And I think as somebody who was a reporter at the very beginning of COVID. Um, it was really difficult to kind of balance, okay, what do, what am I okay to do? What am I not okay to do? Like, is it okay to do this? Um, and Paige's, Paige's thought was, well, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm healthy enough to be able to write this, these stories and these stories need to be written. Um, and I like at the end of the story, just saying, you know, Paige wasn't really sure how she was going to figure everything out, but she would. Um, and she did. Um, so her COVID coverage has been so important. She should win another Pulitzer Prize, but I'm not on the committee, unfortunately. The other thing I want to talk about too that Paige has done that makes her extraordinary is uh, she has helped create this journalism furlough fund. So I don't know if anybody in here has been furloughed in the last year. I certainly have, um, but it's super annoying. There are people who have been uh, who have been laid off because of COVID. Um, 
I'm back in grad school now and I actually study local news and decline of local news a little bit. And, uh, you know, 1200 newspapers have closed in the last decade. And that's a lot of people that need money that used to be journalists. And uh, Paige has helped set up this fund that if you get furloughed, you sign up onto a spreadsheet and you can potentially get money from other reporters who want to kind of fund, kind of help you out for a little bit. And as you can see, the goal was 60,000. And I screenshotted it this afternoon. It's at 103 already. And again, this is just Paige going above and beyond going out of her way to, to help journalists for the journalism cause. Um, I asked some people uh, about Paige, uh, kind of her time in the DN at UNL. Um, as I said, the top quotes from Scott Winner, our former professor um, at UNL, and uh, uh, you know him just saying that she was a killer on the women's bowling beat, uh, that she, you know, will go out of her way to do great stuff. Um, Riley, who I know is here, uh, mentioned uh, Paige willing to uh, be the assistant sports editor whenever uh, we needed one. Um, Paige famously doesn't know anything about sports. Uh, yet has had a, a very tight relationship to them for quite a long time. Uh, and so her being a sports editor was fantastic. I, she was my editor for a little bit. Um, and then Fez, uh, who I don't think is here, but he he did a, he was in the in-depth project with Paige on the Native Daughters. And uh, uh, his example is just a short Q&A turned into like an hours long interview because Paige was genuinely interested in things that normal people usually aren't interested in, which is, again, what makes her a great reporter. Um, I actually went back, me and Paige shared the same high school journalism teacher, and so I asked, you know, what his favorite memory was, and this is great. I think this sums up Paige so well. Um, the first one is the story of Paige when she was a she was freshman, and she was really quiet, and, you know, my journalism advisor wasn't really sure whether or not Paige was going to be cut out for it, if she could, you know, be, be a reporter. And then just like the first assignment, which was a simple interview, um, Paige actually ended up interviewing a murderer. And the problem uh, with the story or problem with the interview was uh, that the murderer started hitting on her. And so they had to stop. And that's a reoccurring story now at Shawnee Mission East uh, of, of uh, journalism and how to interview and how to maybe stop an interview. Um, so I, I think that's, that's just who Paige is. This is why I nominated Paige, okay? So I did an embarrassing thing where I went back through all of uh, me and Paige's uh, Facebook messages for like seven years. And I apologize, Paige should win an award for de just dealing with my shit for like my, the early part of my college career because I was just uh, just the worst. Um, but right before, this is, I was editor in chief in 2015 and the night before the first night, this is what she sent me. She said, enjoy it. You're gonna hate your life pretty soon, but it's gonna be great. And a really short story, I know I'm probably going too long, but when I was a freshman, I wrote a story that the, the athletic department really didn't like. And they ended up taking my credential away. And uh, I was pretty sure I was gonna transfer from Nebraska. And Paige spent that night that everything was going down with me at the Starbucks um, in the union really calming me down and convincing me of the larger picture and understanding what I did was important of shedding light on something. And I'm not the only one that Paige has done that for. Um, and I think the reason why she's so deserving of this award is I think that we think of Hall of Famers as people who have done this, you know, they're at the top of their game and they're the most spectacular or whatever. Um, I, I love you, Paige. You're not Maggie Haberman, <laughs> no offense, right? Nobody is. Uh, you know, you're not, uh, you know, you know, Carl Bernstein, uh, but that's not who I think of when I think of journalism, I think of pages. And I think that the DN Hall of Fame deserves somebody who does all the little things that uh, make a newspaper run and not only make a newspaper run, but make it fantastic. Uh, Paige did the small things of talking to a freshman in a Starbucks, making sure that they were okay. And uh, that's something that the Hall of Fame should, should have in it. So um, if you guys uh, have a have a drink, please raise it. If you want to unmute, I'd like to uh, introduce Paige into the uh, Nebraska uh, uh, Hall of Fame. So please applaud. Yay. Paige, do you have a few words of wisdom you want to impart on us? Uh, I had like a, a sort of speech, but I feel like I just need to respond to all the things Chris said. For starters, the cat. Um, I was a Husker cat. Are they still on campus? The Husker cats? They are? Okay, yeah, I was a yes. Husker cat because I was like a cat with a little cat. 
Yeah, and that ended up being like on the front page of the Lincoln Journal Star, like just real, real rough. Also, I know nothing about sports, um, but yeah, I just don't. So one time I was asking someone uh, to help me identify what was happening in a football photo. And I was like, I don't know what's happening in this photo or who these players are. And someone said, it's like T Tommy Martinez, was that his name? And he's scoring a touchdown, you idiot. Like that's the photo. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I should not have been a sports editor, but it was always uh, super great. And um, yeah, I wrote a lot of weird stuff, didn't I? Wow. Uh, what I loved about being at the Daily Nebraskan was that I immediately felt at home in the newsroom. And I think it was, um, I know some uh, people who were in their student newspapers and it was really competitive and everyone was just, you know, always trying to backstab each other. And the DN always felt really collaborative and really welcoming. Um, so I always, always appreciated that. Um, and yeah, my uh, freshman year roommate was a uh, phone sex operator, like an honest to God, like employed by a phone sex hotline. So I spent a lot of time in the DN to get away from her. Uh, and I wrote about it once. I didn't realize it was still online, but that's crazy. Um, I really do credit my time at the DN with where I am today. Um, I think probably more than the journalism school even. And I technically graduated in 2013, um, but I had an issue where because I was at the DN all the time, I forgot to go to class a lot. Um, so I uh, left for my job at the Seattle Times still with, I think, two classes left. And then for five years, I was in like a war with the journalism school uh, <laughs> because they wouldn't give me my degree and they said I needed to come back to Lincoln. And I said, no, I'm not coming back to Lincoln. I work at the Seattle Times. So it's a big thing for a while. So I'm technically a UNL class of 2019. Um, and they also like, still use me on the brochures and everything, but whatever, it's fine. Um, but certainly to the end. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for this. And I'm really looking forward to coming back to Lincoln and going to going to O'Rourke's and O'Rourke's again and again and again. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's totally there. Congratulations. It's very exciting. Um, okay, we're going to move on to our next one. We we're hoping to be done in an hour. So we'll see if we can pull that off or not. Who knows? Anything's possible. Um, our next award is the Distinguished Alumni Award. It honors an alum that's 36 or older, who's led a distinguished career, and who has demonstrated support for the DM beyond graduation. And our presenter for this tonight is a girl I met when we were 11 and in clarinet class. So my dear friend, Jane Hurt, she was a managing editor at the Daily Nebraskan in 89 and 90. And we met as children and did lots of tequila slammers when we were at the Daily Nebraskan. So Jane, why don't you tell us who's won this award today? All right, well, I'm gonna share my screen. It's not as fancy as uh, Chris's, but it'll have to do. Okay. Give me a thumbs up, Kirsten, if you can see this. All right. So um, as Kirsten said, I have the honor of announcing the winner of the Distinguished Alumni Award. Um, and this year's inductee uh, enrolled at UNL actually, after getting into big trouble at her first college, which was a Christian college, when she snuck out to attend a Rolling Stones concert and got caught. Um, so rather than stick around and uh, deal with the punishment, she just quit and transferred to UNL. And thank goodness that happened. Thank goodness for the Rolling Stones. Um, so she started at the DN right away and she quickly made her mark. Um, and for those of us back in the print days, you'll remember that every DN staff seemed to have that one reporter who always had all the front page stories. And she was that reporter. And by her senior year, she had become the DN's managing editor, which as all former managing editors will tell you is the person who actually does all the work, right? Yes, I'm right. Um, so she and I were not in school at the same time, but I met her right after she graduated because she entered the Lincoln to Chicago pipeline, which was really active in the early 90s. She worked at the City News Bureau, the late great famous City News Bureau uh, in Chicago, then the Chicago Tribune, then the Seattle Times. 
uh, New York Newsday and the Wall Street Journal, where she was an investigative reporter. And she now works at the New York Times. And last year, she shared an appeal to prize for international reporting. I am speaking, of course, of Dion Searcy, who tonight enters the Daily Nebraskan Hall of Fame. Um, though we've known each other for 25 years, I learned a lot of things that I did not know about Dion in her book from her book from 2020. It was called In Pursuit of Disobedient Women, and uh, it describes who she covered and actually, if you read deeper into her history, who she herself is. Uh, in it, she describes her years as the New York Times West Africa, Africa Bureau Chief. Um, she moved to Dakar, Senegal with her husband and three children. And she did just some incredible reporting from the very interesting and sprawling region and, and countries of uh, West Africa. And I highly recommend the book. In it, she also writes about her Nebraska years growing up in Wyamore, Nebraska, uh, coming to Lincoln, starting her journalism career in the basement of the Nebraska Union. And here we see her either editing or being edited by Chris Hopfensberger. She's at the right. And, you know, despite ascending to the pinnacle of journalism, Dion has never lost her most appealing Nebraska traits, in my opinion. Um, she's humble, down to earth. Uh, she's a hard worker and she can laugh at herself. And I must say, she uh, does manage to get a lot of stories about Nebraska into the New York Times. Um, she said, actually, that was her secret to getting onto page one of the Wall Street Journal, was writing about some quirky Nebraska thing. And, and uh, so they would always just speed it right to the, to the front page. So congratulations to Dion. I am proud of all that you have accomplished. And welcome to the Hall of Fame. Um, claps. Let's clap for Dion. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's not on this call, so I will tell her everybody clapped. Uh, I don't think she joined. Did she join in the last few seconds? Dion, if you're here, let me know. But she is currently reporting overseas in a secret place that I'm not allowed to tell you. Uh, but it is also a place with very unreliable Wi-Fi. So uh, I believe the committee asked her to record a few words to share tonight. And so I'm going to give up my screen so someone can do that. OK, I have it. We're going, you're going to give me a thumbs up when you see it, and then you're going to give me a thumbs up whenever, if you can hear it. This is a two, two step Zoom nightmare problem. <laughs> All right. Okay. Can you see it? Great. Now let's hit play and see what happens. Great. Did that come through okay? She said her photographer shot it for her on their way out of the country. And so I'm <laughs> glad you got it. So congrats, Dion. Yay, Dion. And her book is fantastic. If, if you guys haven't read it, I think it's out in paperback now too. It's available on Amazon. And she talks a lot about working at the Daily Nebraska. And so it's very fun to read. So you should all buy it. I'm sure she'd be very happy. Mm. Um, thank you, Jane. Always nice to see you. Um, okay, our next award is the Legacy Award, and that honors a deceased Daily Nebraskan alum who was a visionary or innovator in their career or service to their community. Now, this award is going to be handed out from San Francisco by Jean and Bruce Brugman. Bruce graduated in um, 1958. Um, he worked at the Daily Nebraska. Gene and um, Bruce met at the university, as I understand it. And I guess I'd love to know from you, uh, how did you two meet at the university? And then Bruce, what did you do with the DN? What did I do? Yep. Well, I, let's see. We met, uh, I, I guess, the first time uh, in, in the rag. That's the rag to me. Sorry. Uh, tell her what happened. Um. I had I was not taking any journalism at all, didn't know anything about it, and uh, I had a friend uh, who was what was she, the city editor, 
And uh, I was accompanying her around campus. I was new and she took me right in uh, to meet the editor who she was very fond of. And so that's how, how Bruce and I met. Got it. Bruce, what was your role at the Daily Nebraskan? I was the, I ended up as the, uh, the editor. I, I, I came to Nebraska to play basketball and I uh, played for a year as a freshman. And then Wilt Chamberlain came into the conference and six foot five centers like me were totally out of date. So I quit, went to journalism full time. And I went over to the rag and, and, uh, and started writing for them. And that's what I did for uh, three years. And then the, the last year uh, after my editorship was over, I, uh, I had another year there. Uh, so I worked for the Lincoln Star as a reporter. And, uh, and then you carried through that career. You kept with journalism, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting because uh, I, I trace back, Jean and I, she um, uh, went to the Harvard Business School at the same time that I was at Columbia Journalism School. And we kind of uh, continued our meeting together <laughs> in, in New York and Boston. Anyway, um, she, um, uh, came to San Francisco uh, to work. And uh, then when I went into the army, uh, I went to, uh, I, I ended up going through San Francisco. Anyway, um, what was your question? <laughs> I'm going on and on. I said that you continued a journalism career. And so what did you- Oh, oh I was gonna tell you the, the point, yes, I'm sorry. The right. point that I make, uh, and, and I've written about it out here, is that I, I actually, the idea for doing The Guardian as to what became an alternative paper, when that was a, a, a real force in journalism, was the experience I had on the rag. And in particular, uh, the point that we conducted a major campaign uh, on behalf of uh, an agricultural economics professor, C. Clyde Mitchell, who the administration was trying to get rid of, uh, the chancellor and the dean of uh, college of agriculture. And we did a story on it and it was, and we just continued on it, just kept, kept firing away, firing away, firing away. Finally, at the end of the, at the end of the year, the, the papers end of the year, um, Mitchell, who was in uh, uh, Italy at the time on a Fulbright Fellowship, wrote a very strong blast at the chancellor and at Lambert, who was the Dean of Agriculture, um, essentially uh, saying that um, they were interfering with his academic freedom and he listed seven counts. Anyway, the faculty and faculty uh, Academic Freedom Committee investigated. They spent a year investigating and ultimately they came up and they upheld his charges on every point. They upheld the rag, they upheld us all. And it was really a major victory. I don't think it's ever been overturned in any way that the records are still there. I think they're over at Love Memorial Library. Anyway, what I've said is that it gave me the idea to start a paper, found a paper that you could really make a difference. Even though you're in a big city like San Francisco, you can make a difference if you're doing good solid stories and printing the news and raising hell, which is the phrase that I like to use. Now I say digitize the news and raise hell. That's great. So my start literally was back in the little office at the rag underneath the union where we put out the Guardian. Nebraska. On the Nebraska. <laughs> That's great, Bruce. Well, why don't you tell us who won the Legacy Award? Well, this this is very interesting. I, I uh, knew several of the editors and people going back, but I, I didn't know uh, uh, Susie uh, at all. Uh, I, I hadn't even heard of her. And so, 
I, I, you know, I essentially wasn't really qualified to, to judge except uh, Dan, who's a relentless archivist, uh, went to work and dug out a lot of her stuff from the, uh, uh, the old rags and sent them on to me. And I went through them and, and I kind of moseyed around a little bit. And uh, I, I really got to liking her because her personality came through and her commitment to journalism came through. And she happened to be at the rag at a key moment. She was kind of the transition person between the uh, war rag and the pre, the post-war uh, rag. And um, as a matter of fact, when the key point I think was in reading back, uh, the publications board had an interesting decision to make because they were going from uh, the war tabloid to a broadsheet and they needed a lot of copy and they needed it quickly and they appointed her to that job and she could do it and she did it very well and she carried out uh, she, she, she made it work and she had several well she, she had all the various editorships that you have except the top one <laughs> That was a bit of a problem because she was romantically involved with the editor, uh, uh, a guy by the name of Fritz, and they ultimately uh, got married. But she was um, first woman the first woman, not maybe not the first, but you read back through those old papers and you check the mastheads. It was all mostly, mostly, mostly men. There weren't many women in those jobs. And she really was a trailblazer because she was extremely competent, obviously a very nice person. And she liked, obviously, to be called Susie. And I thought, well, you know, you really can't do a nomination or an award and name somebody called Susie as getting an award. And I looked at the masthead of several of the papers and she was always Susie. She signed her byline as Susie. And she signed her editorials as Susie. So as far as we're concerned or I'm concerned, she's winning the award as, as Susie. So uh, I, I really got a kick out of, out of reading through her stuff. She, her, her, the, the, the issue that she got onto, I think it was really quite important. She had a real uh, solid interest in the United Nations, supporting the United Nations. And this, this sort of thing is controversial with Nebraska. If you can imagine, a lot of things are controversial there that aren't elsewhere. Um, she found that uh, 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 the, uh, there's a collegiate association that was rounding up support for the, League of, for, for, the uh, uh, for the UN. And uh, she wanted to have that at Nebraska. And she found that, um, there were 38 states that had this and all kinds of campuses that had this, but nothing at Nebraska. Nebraska and Wyoming were the only two states in the Midwest that didn't have anything. So anyway, she got going and she did stories on it and she did an editorial on it. And uh, uh, I, 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 Dan has um, put that out. Well, let's, let's see. Uh, I, 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 I took down one of the, a couple of, one, one of the quotes that I thought I got a kick out of. Um, she, um, fiery editorial, supported this collegiate organization that was developing, and this is quotes, informed and dynamic opinion on the United Nations. We believe that the choice for the future lies between a successful United Nations and chaos. We must act now to make the United Nations work. Informed public opinion will in a large way determine the future of the UN. The formation of such an opinion, we as college students will play a vital role. And she noted acidly that the organization that she was talking about was, as I said, the 252, 152 campuses in 38 states 
around the country. And only, that, only Nebraska and Wyoming were not, uh, uh, didn't have anything. So that, that, was, that was her main crusade, but she had other things. And uh, just give you one other, uh, one other quote uh, that I enjoyed. I like fiery editorials and, and she had, a, she had a, a bit of a lock on it. She called this editorial challenge, dot, dot, dot. As usual, this is in quotes, as usual, the student body is doing a lot of talking. As usual, student body is not acting. Dr. Rosenloff, he was there when I was there, sent letters to all organized houses asking room and board or room for one foreign student for a year. Few groups have replied to this letter. <laughs> Can't you imagine the end of fraternity council <laughs> and talk, talk, hearing, hearing something like this? <laughs> kind of tickles me. Some groups, some groups. I think that gives us a pretty good sense of her, actually, Bruce. Yeah. I'm wondering if, well, I, if we, her son is on the call tonight. Is that right? Is Ted Simpson on here to accept on her behalf? I don't, is that right? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, well, I, well, I, I think accepting her award is her son. Yes. Ted, Maybe are you do. on the call here? Yes, I hope so. I hope I we can fill, fill in some spaces. Yep. So Ted said he was going to be on the call, but he also said he was going to be traveling and calling. OK. And I emailed him earlier today, but didn't hear anything. Yeah. So there's perhaps a chance that something came up. So maybe not. So. Yeah. Maybe he'll call in. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's, um, we're trying to finish up in eight minutes. So thank you very much, Bruce. I think that is really interesting, the things that she stood for. She died in 1981. Um, her husband has since passed as well, but they both worked at the Daily Nebraskan. And um, yeah, if the sun jumps on here, we'll hear a little bit more from them. Um, thank you, Bruce and Jean. I think we'll move on to our last award. This is the Extraordinary Staff Award. It recognizes a memorable DN staff whose work defended the principles of academic freedom, the First Amendment, a free and open university, and an independent voice for students. And the presenters of this award are um, the editor and managing editor from 1985 and 86. What a time to be alive. Big hair, shoulder pants, parachute pants. Up, oh, it was so good. Uh, so presenting tonight are Vicki Rugo Westerhouse and Tom Gabrikiewicz, who are both on tonight. Let's hear what they have to say. Hey, thank you, Kristen. It was a great time to be alive. I know, your hair is so <laughs> small now. Vicky. I know, well, it's a headset, you know. <laughs> There's too much noise at my house, I have to leave it on. Okay. <laughs> Tom and I are proud to present the Extraordinary Staff Award to the 1985-86 Daily Nebraskan Sports Staff where they're reporting on the illegal practice held by Husker basketball coach Mo Iba in October 1985. Staff members Bob Osmussen, Mike Riley, Chuck Green, and Jeff Bapol showed extraordinary courage for not only reporting on this controversial event, but also standing firm <laughs> together with all of us as we faced waves of backlash from the university and from fans. Tom, what are your memories of, of that time? Tell us about it. <laughs> So we were sitting around the night of this, and I think it was Chris Welsh who finally got up. You know, and Chris would he was sit in his chair and he would just he would lean back and he got up. And he said, you know what? We gotta do what's right. We gotta do everybody's hounding us. Everybody's gotta do this. It's an illegal, it's one legal practice what's going to matter. So actually Dan Hoppen, who was the our star player at the time, came out last year and said, oh, we had many illegal practices. And so it validated what we did. We got so much blowback uh, while we were sitting there. And he said, you, you got to do what's right. And we've got to do this. And that's what we did. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, and I'd love to hear from Bob and Mike and Chuck and, and Jeff. At the time, I didn't anticipate 
the blowback we'd get. It seemed pretty cut and dry. It's like they're cheating. It's an illegal practice. We've got to run the story and report on it. Not understanding uh, that, you know, as things progressed, uh, IBA denied it. The university, you know, Bob Devaney and others denied it. And I, to us, it was just cut and dry that it was the right thing to do. Um, then we get these comments from fans. You know, How can you rat out your own team? You're horrible. How could you do that? So I, I think we thought we did the right thing. And it's, you know, it's, it, it was interesting going back and looking at the stories that came out. You know, Dan was kind of we wringing his hands. We were, we, naive, we, were, but... we were naive to know that everybody was going to go, yeah, this is, this is a problem. We can do this. And we're talking about Nebraska athletics. <laughs> and this sports staff, no other sports staff, I don't think in the history of the Dale and Nebraska has done the work and done the reporting and done what needed to be done. And we got poked back and pushed back. And I think it was a new era of, okay, these are student journalists. We are getting, so everybody followed us. All the media across Nebraska followed the Dayton Nebraska. They followed journalists who were 19 years old couldn't drink at the time. That doesn't mean they didn't drink. Well. <laughs> Very true. Well, sure. So one of my favorite memories is after the story ran that afternoon. So Iba denies he was having a legal practice. And I get a call from, from Devaney. It was, it was probably happy hour, maybe a little early for happy hour, but for most of our standards. <laughs> He was not happy. He was, he sounded a little slightly intoxicated and just, you guys are little shits. I can't believe you did this. And he was just up one side and down the other. And I was kind of like, you know, I stood in line for this man's autograph when I was a kid. I can't believe, you know, I just had this call with him. And Bob, you were so awesome. You were cool. He said, you don't worry about it. He's down at the strip club. He won't remember anything tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it was he was interesting. The, uh, and so I, I think one of the, one of the best things, Bob, and that you guys ever did was make make a tape. Because if you hadn't had that tape, there's no way that we could have come out of this. And you know, they were just sweeping under the rug, saying it didn't happen. And one of the hardest parts, I think, is when we played the tape for the Omaha World Herald reporters and the Lincoln Journal Star reporters. Oh, it was Jeff. Okay, Jeff brought the tape in the recorder. Thank you, Mike. So we play the tape for them, thinking, okay, they're going to report the story the same way we did. And instead, they come out saying the tape was inconclusive, which is the same thing that, that Devaney and others said about it. Exactly. So, and if anybody can jump in, I don't know how this happened, but somehow an Omaha TV station picked up the tape and they actually played it on the news with captions and everybody heard it. And from that point on, it's like, okay, it was a game changer. But without that tape, we would have had a tough time. <laughs> so, Bob, what do you want us to tell us about this event? You uh, headed up that staff in those days. So Bob Ospison, I know you're on the call. Any thoughts you want to share with us from that time? Sure. I, I want the main thing I want to say, first of all, it's great to see everybody. The Dan hasn't changed. That's crazy. And <laughs> great to see Vicki. Great to see Tom. I miss you. Miss you guys. Really, it's great to see you. Um, the main thing was, it was such a team effort. Mike Riley, Jeff April, Chuck Green, Dan Delaney, Kathleen Green, Vicky, everybody played a role. Everybody did their part. We knew we we had it because I'd been told by somebody very reliable. I, I won't name, will never name, He's never named. That this was going on. We knew it was going on and we caught them and they never admitted it, but they fired the coach. So maybe they did admit it at the end. But I think, um, again, I, th I credit the people that were with me. And Jeff Abel is the hero here because he was smart enough to bring a tape recorder, a little micro cassette, slid, slid it on the door. You could hear Mo Iba screaming uh, commands, handle, take your time, get a good shot, things like that. Remember it like it was yesterday. And Jeff did. A, Jeff was the hero, really, in my mind. He's the one that saved it, and the photographers, everybody. And the other thing I want to say was I think Bob Devaney. I think he got caught blindsided by this. I don't think he knew that this was going on, or maybe he did, just didn't care. 
but it really forced his hand, and I think that was not what he wanted. So Vicky's conversation with him makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, but again, it was, a, it was a fun time, kind of scary time, but uh, interesting time. And I think they stopped practicing. I was told by players that they had to take a week off from practice, so they probably were happy about the whole thing. But it was really a, a good moment, I think, in the Delhi Nebraska's history, and I was proud to be a part of it and really proud to be with these great people that are all still here and doing great work. That's about it for me. That's great. So Riley, Chuck, Jeff, any of you have quick sound bites for us? Our time is running out here tonight. Oh, that's a good point. So uh, I, I, I don't have uh, too much to add, but uh, uh, you know, this, this award, uh, you know, Bob was our leader um, and uh, he was a sports editor uh, and, and we followed his lead and he's the one that got the tip on Mo. Uh, and, you know, we followed what, what he guided us to. And I put in the chat, uh, several other stories that staff broke uh, that that year. I mean, it was a pretty good run. Uh, it was a little different era for sports then. Uh, we were thought of as a toy department. Um, we, we thought otherwise. And so I'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, Chuck, Jeff, if you guys have anything to read it up. So I, I will, I actually, I want to say we were never afraid to put sports news on the front page. That's true. Good point. All right, well, congratulations, my fellow 80s grads. What a time to go to school. It's all good. Um, so we're gonna, uh, we have three more people that are gonna speak. We are gonna hear from the current DN editor, Grace Gornflow, and then the DN editor for next year, David Berman. And then we have a very special guest that's gonna close us out. So Grace, why don't you let us know what you want us to know? Hi everyone. Um, yes, I'm Grace Gornflo. I have just a few more weeks here at the Daily Nebraskan. No, I have to attention I'm very sorry. Hold on. Just a reminder that I'm quite at the university. I have to do a blink on policy. Just cover my two women. Thank you for your compliance to protect the community from COVID-19. We have hourly mask announcements in the union, so I apologize for oh, that. That's, that's fun. Um, yeah. So I just kind of wanted to talk about how helpful the Alumni Advisory Board has been this year. Um, as you can imagine, this has been an incredibly weird year at the Daily Nebraskan. Um, leading in a pandemic is not something I ever thought I would have to do. And I'm really grateful that Alan has put together this Alumni Advisory Board. Um, even in just the short time I've had with them, we've done some incredible workshops and even people not on the advisory board, um, like Chris Hetty, for example, um, have been so incredibly helpful to me through all of the challenges that this year has brought. Um, I think our alumni base is the only reason I remained sane this year. So um, thank you to all of you who have helped me. And I just wanted to say that like, we really, really appreciate you even if it's just like a quick email, um, one sentence of advice, it means way more than you know. So yeah, I hope to see more of you in the future now that I'm going to be a DN alum as well. And thank you. And yeah, hi. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. David, are you super scared for the future or you've got this? I think a little bit of both. Um, it's definitely been a, <laughs> A very weird year, a very weird year here, like um, Grace has said. Um, I think um, in, in the few months since I was hired, um, Grace has taken me under her, her wing and uh, taught me the ropes of the position. And so definitely feel very prepared for next year, but um, I think it's very uncertain what next year is going to look like, at least from a COVID perspective. I'm really hopeful that um, we can get back to some sort of semblance of normal at the university and um, within the office. Um, I hired my senior staff a few weeks ago, which is really, really exciting. We have um, 11 of our 19 senior staff next year or on our current senior staff. I think that's pretty rare for the DN. There's usually a lot more turnover there. Um, so we have a very, very experienced senior staff next year that I'm really excited to work with. And yeah, I, I think um, I've already heard um, from various alumni um, in, in the few months that I've been in the position. Um, and um, I've yeah, been very grateful to hear from all of you. 
I've spoken with the advisory board and definitely excited to have some trainings next year with all of you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really value having such a strong alumni base to draw wisdom from um, uh, when I need it. So yeah, definitely excited to, to, to hopefully work with all of you um, in the next year. I'm sure you'll be great. We are totally here for you. Obviously we care. We wouldn't be on this call tonight. Um, and we're cheering for you to be successful and break more stories in one day when your own Pulitzer, just like our award winners tonight. So hooray. Um, okay, that is almost the end, but we are going to wrap up with um, the person that is near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, Dan Chatil is going to let us know how his year of a general manager emeritus is going and uh, oh. <laughs> what's on the horizon for him. So Dan, oh. take it away, close us out. Dan, oh, yeah. Dan, 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 Dan. Dan. <laughs> yeah, I've been traveling the, the, the world the last uh, year or so, going from country to country and, and um, uh, at least that's what my plans were. So I have things to still look forward to. Um, but but uh, I just wanna say uh, most of you have fond memories working at the Daily Nebraskan. You've made lifelong acquaintance, acquaintances here. Some found their spouses here. Uh, you had unforgettable experiences that you depended on in your, for future years. And what you all gain by working at the Daily Nebraskan though pales to how you impacted the campus community with your work. Uh, and I wish to thank you all for that. Uh, we've heard several examples tonight and there are countless more. Uh, I'm honored to have worked amongst you where almost all of you were all-stars, if not Hall of Famers. But please keep, uh, keep us, please help us keep both your memories and the Daily Nebraskan strong. Stay active in our alumni relations nominate future Hall of Famers, uh, give advice to our current and future staff members, and don't forget to donate to our DN Excellence Fund. Uh, thank you and have a good night and a great year. Special invitation from San Francisco. Anybody that comes from the, from the RAG or the, the DN, the, the, the Daily Nebraskan, to check with me and I'll take you for a lunch uh, martinis and lamb chops at the Sam Spade Grill, John's Grill, which is where, and, and the booth that uh, Dashiell Hammett used to sit in regularly. It's a nice little place. So just keep that in mind. If you, you're coming out here, let me know. Thanks for the offer, Bruce. Thanks everybody. Great to see you. Yep. We need like a song to play us out. Don't yeah. I know. Kirsten, I thought you were singing. Never mind. We'll have to figure that out for the next Zoom call. How to pipe in music. <laughs>